We don't want to just be talking in an echo chamber here. We don't want to be pyromaniacs in a field of straw men. And so we, we sometimes invite left-wingers on the show to present the strongest version of their point of view. I'm always very grateful when left-wingers come on the show. Uh, not an easy thing to do. Most, most of them just refuse to do it. So I'm very pleased that our guest is Bronte Remzik, who is a, a third-year medical student, a social activist, uh, very much in support of legal abortion. We've gone back and forth on TikTok and Twitter and MySpace and all sorts of social media platforms. So we thought, let's just have her on the show and discuss the issue. Bronte, thank you so much for coming on. Hi, Michael. I can't say that it's a pleasure, but I'm excited to help you expand your perspective. Well, that's very kind of you to do that. So Bronte, before we get to the issue of abortion itself, which I suspect we will get to, I guess we have to get to this issue that Anna Kasparian raised and that is really at the heart of this Supreme Court decision in the past week of the news cycle. Namely, does the Constitution enshrine a right to abortion? It seems very difficult to argue that it does. One, because I don't see that right anywhere. The judges who decided that there was a right in 1973, a right that previously had never been acknowledged in the Constitution, they said that it was found within the emanations and the penumbras, and they couldn't quite point to exactly where it was, but hey, anyway, it's there. Then you had Planned Parenthood v. Casey in the early 1990s, which actually overruled part of Roe versus Wade, at least in the argument for why we needed legal abortion, but nevertheless upheld legal abortion, and it was all kind of just a big jumbled mess. So is it your position that the Constitution provides for some heretofore invisible right to an abortion, regardless of what you think about the issue? It is my opinion that we have a right to privacy and abortion is a medical procedure. And the right to privacy does extend to the discussions between a patient and a medical provider. Okay. But I, I could have a right to privacy with my mafia capo and we could decide to whack my political enemy. And those, I guess those conversations would be private. I don't, I don't think there is some generalized right to privacy in the constitution, but even if they were, that would have no bearing on the life of the person that we're going to kill, right? Well, the discussion between you and your mafia friend is very different from a discussion between a patient and a medical provider. We have laws that protect patient privacy for this exact reason. But but I suppose you're, you're right. The distinction is that right now it's illegal for me to talk to my mafia boss and call out a hit on someone I don't like. And it is legal right now, at least according to the civil law, for a woman to talk to a doctor and kill her child. But that very likely will not remain legal if Roe versus Wade is overturned in 13, 14 states, instantly that will become illegal. So I, I guess I'm just talking about the matter itself beyond questions of the civil law, which might be changing in real time right now. What's the difference? If, if you're saying it's all about a right to privacy, I'm saying, no, it's, it's about the baby that's being killed. So do you have an answer for that? Or are we just denying yeah. the humanity of the baby? No, absolutely. So when you put up a scenario of trying to put out a hit with the mafia, you are talking about murdering a born, living, conscious, sentient, and autonomous person. When we talk about abortion, we are talking about ending a non-autonomous life. It does You do not have the right to bodily autonomy if you are not autonomous. And if you are a fetus prior to the limit of viability, you do not have autonomy. Therefore, you do not have the right to bodily autonomy. This is a you great point. You reside inside of the body of an autonomous person, and the right to bodily sure. autonomy allows you to refuse to use your body to support the life of another person. So uh, th this is a, a precise and important point you've made. You, you've acknowledged that abortion ends a life, but you've said, those were your exact words, you just said that uh, the life is not autonomous. Would you say that a uh, two-day-old post-birth baby is autonomous? It is, it has bodily autonomy and it's able, its body system is able to function autonomously. Yes. The, you the are baby trying can to get feed to itself? the point, you the, are trying to get to the point where they require external resources, but any person can provide that infant external resources. The utilization of someone's internal organs is very different from providing external resources. You cannot force someone to be a parent and provide external resources. You can give up that child at any point that you stop consenting to your parental responsibilities and your parental rights. Okay, so, so this, that's fine. So, so we've acknowledged now that the baby is, is living in the womb or outside the womb. It's a living being and that the baby is... It's not really autonomous. I mean, maybe it has 
it, it, it's not attached by an umbilical cord, but it, it certainly doesn't have autonomy when it's two days old. It needs to, it needs to eat. It needs everything taken care of for it. What you're saying is, though, once the umbilical cord has been severed, the baby can be taken care of by someone else. So then my question is, why would we not merely encourage adoption? If the mother feels she can't take care of the baby, why not just give up the baby for adoption rather than killing the baby in the womb? Because pregnancy in itself is a very serious medical condition that has physical, mental, emotional, and financial burdens for the pregnant person. Yep. And to force a person to endure that experience against their will is simply immoral, and it's belittling the experience that pregnancy is. Well, so when you say against their will, what you are, you're referring to cases of, of rape, basically. Right, no. because because you, you well, when you engage in sex, you are engaging in an act of the will. The consequence of which is, historically speaking, always pregnancy. Correct, but when you consent to sex, you're not consenting to pregnancy. You are consenting to the possibility of pregnancy. But you can think right. of it like this. You can think of it like this. You understand the difference between consensual sex and sexual sexual assault. You should then understand the difference between wanted pregnancy and unwanted pregnancy. Technically, physically, they are the same thing. But when your body is being used against your will and without your consent, those are very different experiences for the person. But Bronte, you, you, you've just acknowledged that when you consent to sex, you are consenting to the possibility of pregnancy. So there you have it. There you are. You have consented to that. Now, you might not want to become pregnant. You might want to use all sorts of contraceptives and things like that. But surely, I mean, you've just said it yourself, you are consenting to that possibility. And so now you're telling me that if one wants to then withdraw one's consent because one doesn't want to be uncomfortable for some matter of months, you're saying that the, the better alternative is to just kill the baby whom you have acknowledged is alive? First of all, calling pregnancy simply discomfort is belittling the experience. But you can also no, it's, think it's it like beautiful this. and no. miraculous too. But yes, it's also says, uncomfortable. Says the white man who will never experience it. Ex but well, Bronte, you can I, think of it. No, I, I, so I thought that can can men become pregnant or no? If you have a uterus, a, a man with do a, you uterus have a uterus can. Uterus, Michael. So because I could, if you don't have a uterus, then you're not the men with a, that we're Well, look, about. I'm not a biologist, so I'm not sure if I'll become pregnant. I do have a little emoji that tells me that these days men can become pregnant, regardless. Regardless of that, if you're talking about non-consensual sex, what percentage of pregnancies arise from rape, incest, or involve a threat to the life of the mother? Well, it's hard to say because about three quarters of sexual assault go unreported. So any statistic that I would give to you is going to be inherently inaccurate. I'll give you a statistic, a statistic from the, the most left-wing source I can give, the Guttmacher Institute. It's the think tank for Planned Parenthood. Less than 1% of abortions take place because of rape, incest, or pose a threat to the life of the mother. So we're talking about yeah, an extraordinarily small According to the ones that have number. been reported. According to the ones that have been reported. Don't you, don't you, you think, don't you think if there were, report. don't you think if there were a, a scarier statistic that the most pro-abortion organization in the country might use those statistics? But these statistics are very difficult to collect because, again, sexual assault is a difficult issue when people don't often report them because you see how our political system doesn't often support victims of sexual assault. It, and so it, our system doesn't support people reporting sexual assault. Therefore, it is underreported. So th th this seems difficult for me, Bronte. Because, well, one, I, it seems that uh, in the years after the Me Too movement, there was quite a great political impulse to report sexual assault and all sorts of sexual issues. But furthermore, you're telling me that we need to rely on these statistics, trust the science, trust the public health organizations when it's convenient for your argument and convenient for abortion. But we shouldn't trust the statistics when it's inconvenient for your argument, argument and supports the pro-life argument. That is incorrect. You simply don't understand how these statistics work and how they are collected. When you understand and when you analyze statistics, you have to understand the bias and the flaws that they have. And what you are specifically citing statistics that have inherent flaws, that doesn't mean that all of the st statistics that we cite are inherently flawed. You have to understand the issue okay. at hand and how those statistics are collected. Okay, fair enough. So, so you're saying you just, you don't believe these statistics that are inconvenient, but you say you have perfectly good reason not to believe the statistics. I suppose the question, though, is really beyond the statistics, isn't it? If you are acknowledging, Bronte, that uh, the baby is uh, alive, if you are acknowledging that the baby could be given up for adoption, if you are acknowledging that instances of rape are, are I think we can acknowledge they're quite rare, at least when we're talking about, even if you dispute some of the statistics, they're, they're the exception, not the rule. Uh, if you are acknowledging all sorts of, if you are acknowledging the relatively low maternal mortality rate, if you are acknowledging 
the advancements in, in science, if you are acknowledging that very, very few women die every year from illegal abortions and uh, all, all sorts of the, the other scare statistics that come out, if you're acknowledging all of those numbers, even beyond that, don't, don't we still have the fact of the baby? Don't we still have the non-utilitarian, non-statistical simple fact that you're talking about a living human being? No. So first off, you said that we have a low mortality rate, which yeah. actually we have one of the highest maternal mortality rates amongst all of the developed countries. But it's, it's still so quite low. What's, what is the maternal mortality rate, according to the CDC? I don't know it off the top of my head. I 20 simply out of, know that. 20 out of 100,000. And, and that includes communities that do not have very good public health outcomes because of various behaviors mm-hmm. and pathologies in the community. So it's relatively right. quite low. How many women died from illegal abortion the year before Roe versus Wade? I'm not sure, but that's besides the point. 39 women. How many women died from legal abortion the year before Roe versus Wade? I think what you're misunderstanding is that death is not the only negative outcome of pregnancy. Just because you don't die does not mean that your life and your body is not impacted for the rest of your life. Because a lot of people are left with chronic pain and your body is functionally and structurally altered. And so death is not the most accurate statistic to determine whether or not pregnancy is a negative experience. There, there we go. So, so we, we move past the question of death and we say, well, really, it's, forget about death for a second. It's just that it's, it's very uncomfortable. And not only uncomfortable for nine months, it might be uncomfortable for the rest of your life or it might change your body chemistry. It might change the way you look or it might change. Is any of that, Bronte, I'll, I'll leave you with this because I know we're way over the time. Is any of that an argument? Now that we've kind of chipped away I I think at least it's up for the viewers to decide, chipped away at the constitutional argument or the legal argument or the statistical argument or the argument for mortality. Now we get down to, well, it's just, I just don't like what it does to my body. Is that an argument, Bronte, for killing a human being who you admit is alive? Absolutely. Everyone has the right to determine the status of their body. They have the right to decide when and how their body is used. And if you would like to go back to, I know that you've had a lot to say about vaccines and masks, so I don't think it's very confusing for you to understand when you are concerned about certain effects that certain things might have on your body. Someone has every right to decide whether or not they consent to that. Well, my my only issue with the masks and all the COVID stuff is that it's very silly and disordered, but I'm I'm not not even making some sort of maximal bodily autonomy argument. Regardless, though, Mm -hmm. I think they're a little different because we're acknowledging the baby. So so I would I guess I would leave you with this thought from Naomi Wolf, a uh, well, well-known feminist, uh, made this point in the 1990s. She said that what the pro-abortion movement needs to be able to do is defend abortion. And she was, and I think still may be, a defender of abortion. She said, we need to defend abortion by acknowledging the baby, the unborn baby. We need to say that the unborn baby is a baby. Stop pretending he's not a human. Stop pretending he's not alive. Acknowledge that he's a baby and say that for women to be equal, they must be able to kill the baby in all of his humanity. Would you agree with that statement? What I agree with is that in order to protect and value an unborn, non-viable, non-sentient life, no, you have to act No, you have to actively devalue and dehumanize the pregnant person. You cannot pretend to protect unborn life without actively dehumanizing and devaluing the pregnant person and removing their bodily autonomy. And that is the issue at hand. It seems to me when we treat women as mothers, we are valuing them. It's, I don't think it's, I think it's devaluing women to use them for sex and try to avoid the consequences of sex by killing the baby and then pretending it's somehow legitimate because the baby is not sentient. So as though we could kill someone in a coma or as though someone who were asleep, the baby were not particularly conscious as though we could kill people who had mental disabilities. I don't think any of those arguments really work. And I think, I think the issue that's at, at heart here is that you are suggesting that uh, women uh, being used as vessels for sexual pleasure without dealing with the consequences of sex, namely the creation of human beings, that that is somehow more liberating and more empowering than women coming together uh, in love and giving that love with a man to a human being. I, th- I think that's what yeah. it really comes down to. I find it interesting that whenever you talk about women having sex, you say that we are used, and that proves the fact no, that No, not whenever. Not, not whenever. Right? Only, oh, no, 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 only in, in your like version it. of it. Not, not in, no. I, I don't think women Incorrect. should be used for sexual pleasure. Incorrect. It, does, it seems like men still believe that sex is something that they do to women no. and not No, no, no. I, I, you must have misheard me, Bronte. I said that you men and women... No, I, I, and I don't think I did, but that's up for the listeners to decide. I said that the, the more valuing, liberating, flourishing view of sex 
sex, is that men and women come together because they are complementary, they love one another, they join together in marriage, and they create new human life. And that's a beautiful, miraculous, wonderful thing. And I think that the the view of the pro-abortion movement is that women ought to be used as uh, merely uh, vessels for sexual pleasure with, with an out of accountability, such that if there is a product of love or maybe not so much love, namely a child that comes out of that sexual union, that that baby ought to be killed. I think that's a devaluing of women uh, rather than a valuing or a liberation. Minimizing women's value to the role of motherhood is simply misogynistic. Minimizing. I think that's maximizing, frankly. I think, yeah, I think according it's to I think the universe. your worldview, which is obviously flawed. Well, I don't know. We, we were both born of mothers, and I'm quite happy for that value that was added to my life. And uh, I'm very happy that my mother consented to the pregnancy that brought me forth. But I would yeah. never want my mother to bring me into the world against her will. All right. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't think that... Uh, I don't think our discussion of will or value or any of those things, I, I, I think it has boiled down to this, this particular point of, of what the body is for, right? I mean, isn't that kind of what we're talking about here? Is, is our body for, is sex for the maximal individual pursuit of pleasure? Or is it for something else? Is it for a baby? Is it for a uh, unitive love? Is it for something beyond just our own desires? Your body is whatever you want it to be used for. That is the basis of consent and bodily autonomy. You cannot decide what the use and value of someone's body is for them. And that is the root of the pro-choice stance. What about the, what about the body of the baby in, in the abortion? When the, bo- when, the baby, when the baby lacks autonomy and it requires the body of an autonomous person in order to live, that autonomous person must exercise their bodily autonomy. And at any point, they must consent to supporting that possible life. Must exercise. All right. I'm way over as usual, Bronte. But I, listen, I really appreciate your coming on. Uh, it uh, takes, takes a lot of chutzpah. I know there's a lot of sexual confusion these days, but it takes cojones to come on a conservative show and discuss the issue. Uh, I, I hope that uh, as you think about this issue and stew on it some more, that uh, your eyes are opened to the, the reality of the situation. But I, I appreciate your coming on. In any case, Bronte Remzik, where can people find you? Absolutely. They can find me on TikTok at Bronte Remzik. I also have my website is BeKindAndCurious.com. All right. Thank you, Bronte. Appreciate it. I'm glad you liked that clip. Now, Ring the bell, subscribe, get all those notifications. Head on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you get your audio podcasts. Subscribe to The Michael Knowles Show. We'll see you next time.